Praise God. I mean, I, 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 I'm still so, praise God. Amen. I'm impressed with how God does things. Amen. Amen. We looked all over the city. What you saw when we were looking for a house? Praise God. And who, uh, how did I know I moved right next door to another pastor and preacher? <laughs> First thing he said when he found out I was a pastor, we got to go out and back to the neighborhood. We got to set up tracks. We got to set up Praise God, but no further ado, praise God. I present to you and some of us, praise God. He's been here before. Praise God, never spoken, but he's been here. Amen. Brother George, his lovely wife, Ruthie, praise God. God bless him on this morning. Amen. Let's give him a good round of Sometime after the Babylonian exile, 
And the mention of sacrifice being offered indicating the work of rebuilding the temple was also complete. By the time the initial thrill of returning to the land after decades of exile had one worn thin during the time of Nehemiah, Elisha, the high priest, had allowed Judah's enemies, Tobiah, to store his personal belongings in the, in the temple. The people intermarried with their pagan neighbors and grew weary of worship. The people of Judah had taken the blessings they had received for granted to such an extent that they questioned whether God had ever loved them. When the Lord declared his love through the prophets, the people once responded with a kind of adolescent pet pudence, asking, how have you loved us? God proved his love in the nature of the content of his response to the ungracious challenge with the kind of patience and loving might might show a stubborn and unreasonable child. The Lord gently outlined in many ways he had proved his love to Israel. In the past, in particular, he remembered that the, 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 the descendants of Jacob had, had been blessed in a way in, that the descendants of Esau had not experienced. Mm -hmm. Confusion about whether God cares about us can be traced all the way back to closing to the Old Testament. Even some of the most religious people in the world wondered how they could believe in God who said he loved them, loved them while acting as though he didn't. About 450 B.C., Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, said to Israel, giving the word of the Lord, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? And that's the title of my message. How has God loved us? Like Nahum in chapter 1, verse 1, in Habakkuk in chapter 1 and verse 1, Malachi called his message a burden in verse 1 of this chapter. It was not easy for Malachi, as it is not easy for anyone, to strip the veneer of, of the piety of the priests and expose their hypocrisy, or repeat the complaints the people were secretly voicing against the Lord. But that's what God called Malachi to do, to expose their sin. The task of the prophet, says Eugene Peterson, is not to smooth things over, but make things right. All right. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul said that we're to rightly divide the word of truth. That idea is cut, cut it straight. All right. We're not to mince what and try to water it down what God has said or has told us to do. Come on. Here in chapter 1, he reveals three of the people's sin. Malachi does. All right. He he will look, we will only look at the first one because if we looked at all of them as long winded as I am, we'd be here all day. But I'm not even sure I'll finish what I've got this morning. But all right. The first one was this, and it's found in our text in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 1 of Malachi. And that is doubting God's love. Now, all of us, we would be hypocrites and probably be liars if we say that there hasn't been a point in our life where we were in that same boat. There's some point in our lives that we doubted God's love. Amen. We, we ask the question that they ask, how does God love me? Look at where I'm at. Look at my circumstances. And that's the reason that we do this, because we begin to look at our circumstances. All right. Amen. All right. Malachi, Malachi begins by pointing out the people's lack of love for God. Mm. We notice that this was the first sin that Jesus mentioned when he wrote to the seven churches in the book of, the, in the book of Revelation to Asia Minor. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. The first sin, their lack of love for God. All right, all right. Perhaps it is mentioned first because a lack of love for God is the source of all other sins. Think about it. When we, when we fail to remember the God that we serve, the nature that He is, and the kind of God that He is, it then leads us to the things that we should not I've said this before, I said it to the rest of the all the time, the guys here, that our understanding and our view of God is the most important thing you will ever do. All right. If you have a wrong concept of God, you will not understand anything else about life. All right, come on. You will never be, under, you will never be able to comprehend what it is about and what God is trying to do. But the first century, the Jews recited the Shema as their daily prayer. It went like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. Yes. They repeated that every day. Mm -hmm. but now they come to a point in their life that they have forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And they ask the question, Lord, how have you loved us? Mm -hmm. the, the people of Malachi preached, 
preached, had uh, people, Malachi had come to preach to, doubted that God even loved them. So why should they love him? Again, I am convinced when you read the text and you read the entirety of it, it's because they begin to look at their circumstances. They begin to look at themselves, and then they begin to doubt what God's love had done to them. Malachi presents several evidences of God's love for Israel. Let me give them to you this morning. First of all, we pray that, that God, he states it, number one, God clear statement of his love in chapter in verse 2. He said, I have loved you. So Malachi presents God's clear statement that he loves them. They ask, how is it that you love them? He clearly has stated so that he loved them. Interesting that the Bible said in John 3, 60, God so loved the world, he gave. He has demonstrated, not only stated that he loves us, but he's demonstrated that he loves us. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 4, the Apostle Paul said that he, he, he saved us even when we were dead in our sins. He loved us. Yes. Even when we were outside of him, we were enemies of his, he yes. loved us. So Malachi says the clear proof that God loves us is that he has said so. He said, I love you. When God gave the law at Sinai, the emphasis was on obey the law because I am a holy God. But when Moses reviewed the law for the new generation, the emphasis was on obey the Lord because you love you and you love him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both of these motives are valid today. We should love him because of his law, because of what he do what he's asking to do, and also because that he loves us. Yes. Yes. The next evidence of God, God's love that Malachi presented is God's electing grace. Look at me at verse at the rest of verse 2. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved. Malachi says the second evidence of God is God's elective grace. The Vines Expository Dictionary of the New Testament word points out this. The type of love God has towards man is not prompted out of self-interest. It is only its only object is the welfare of those towards whom it is directed. Man has done nothing worthy of God's love, and God loves God's love is one sided. That and that man is the beneficiary of it. We ought to be glad of that. Amen. God loved if God first loved us. The Bible is very clear in Romans chapter 3. Paul makes it very clear that there, that there is no one who seeks after God. There's no one who's looking for God. People run around talking about they're looking for God. Nobody's looking for God. Why? Because man is the, since the Garden of Eden, man has been going in the opposite direction. All right. When Adam sinned, he didn't go towards God. He ran away That's from right. God. Amen. Every time you find an example of sin in the believer's life, what does he do? He runs away from God. Come on. That's it. Amen. And so... God's electing love, choice to love us. You see, love as applied to God is without self-interest and is totally motivated for the well-being of those who love us. God loves us. And what he does for us is because of that love. Amen. Mm -hmm. Listen to God's response to their question. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated and lay waste his mountain and his heritage. As the firstborn, you all know this story, Esau should have inherited the blessing and the birthright. Mm -hmm. But the Lord gave them to Jacob, the younger brother, Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 to 23. Esau's descendants had their land assigned to them, but God gave the Edomites no covenant of blessing as he did Jacob's descendants. The statement that God loved Jacob but hated Esau troubles people. A lot of people have a problem with that. They say, how is it that God, who is a God of love, can write and say that he hates, hated Esau and yet loved Jacob? The statement that God loved Jacob and hated Esau troubles people. Paul quotes in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 to 13, proves God's elected grace for both Israel and Israel. And all who trust Jesus Christ for salvation. Let's go back to that. Look with me at Romans chapter 9 very quickly. Because I state that, and if you've never read it, you don't know what I'm talking about. All right. Romans chapter 9. And let's look at what Paul says. Beginning with verse 10.
Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. I want to call your attention to the verse. Uh, go back again. He said, For the children not having yet been born have done any good or bad. So God's choice of Jacob wasn't because of who Jacob was or what he had or had not done. Remember, we said that God's love is not, is not, is, is not dependent upon you and I. God's love is of his own accordance that he loves you and I. Not because of who we are or what we are or what we've done, but because he loves us. You see, the statement that God loved Jacob, it, that may, that, it does trouble people. Paul mentions it here in this chapter. Someone, someone, someone said, a gift a Hebrew Christian of a generation ago, said, he said, I have a serious problem with Malachi chapter 1 and verse 3, where God says, Esau, I have hated. The Hebrew Christian responded by saying, I have a greater problem with Malachi chapter two, 1 and verse 2, where God says, Jacob, I love. You see, you and I cannot complain, can, cannot explain the love of God, nor do we have to. But we can experience God's grace and love as we trust Christ and walk with Him. The historian went on to say, he said, the people that have a problem with it, with the part that God hated Esau, have, he has a problem with those who agree with the other part. So, the second evidence of God's love was that His elected grace. He said, I have chosen Jacob and disregarded Esau. The third evidence of Malachi gives of God's love is God's evident blessing on the people of God. Look at how God showed His love to the Jewish people. He spared the Jews who were in exile in Babylon, Jeremiah chapter 29. He spared them there. Then he, he moved Cyrus to issue a decree that enabled the Jews to return to Judah and to rebuild the temple. He provided the leadership of Joshua, the high priest, Zer Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, Ezra, as well as the prophetic ministry of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Had the people, had the people obeyed the terms of the covenant, the word would have blessed them even more. They were weak, they were a weak remnant, but the word was with them and promised to bless them. Look at the name God uses in verse 4, Lord of hosts. Of the chapter. It's a name that's used 24 times in Malachi and nearly 300 times in the Old Testament. The Lord of Hosts. This is the military name of God. The word host comes from a Hebrew word meaning to wage war. The Lord is the commander of the host, sand of heaven. He's the warrior. The star, he, host, Saying to them, the stars, Isaiah chapter 40, the angels, Psalms 103, the armies of Israel, Exodus chapter 12, and all who trust him, Psalms 46, he's the Lord host of all these. Finally, Malachi reminds him of the great privileges God gave him to witness to the Gentiles in verse 5. He said in verse 5, go back to Malachi. He says in verse 5, your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the borders of Israel. We need to remind ourselves that our trials we experience as individuals or as a congregation are opportunities to glorify God in a watching yes. world. Amen. Yes. Paul in the New Testament viewed his imprisonment and impossible death in Rome this way, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 22 and 26. We must look at the testing God sent our way as an opportunity to demonstrate to others what the Lord can do for those who put their trust in Him. The Bible says God is love. 
1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 teaches us that God is that God is love. It teaches us that God is love. So not only does God love, but love, but love is a part, an essential part of his nature. Yes. So not only does he love, but he is love. Yes. When, you, when you think about love, you think about God. Because that's his, that's his essential nature. As a prism separates simple shaft of light into a spectrum of color, so the scripture separates the love of God in different shades and meanings. We see it, we see his love demonstrated in different ways. Yes. And sometimes, because there's different ways, sometimes we fail to see, we fail to recognize, hey, God is this is the way God is showing his love. Right. Well, he's demonstrating his love to us. Let's look at three shades of his love. First of all, God love, loves in different ways. The Bible says that God is love. It also shows that, that He loves in different ways, in different degrees, with different results. We all experience that. We all don't experience the love of God the same way that others do. Right. In the way that He shows Amen. His love towards us. Right. The Bible teaches us that God loves impartially. He loves us impartially without prejudice. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. God loves us impartially without prejudice. He doesn't take into account what we are, or what we have been, or what we've done, or what we're going to do, He still loves us. And that's easy for Him because of the fact that that's His nature. That's His nature. It's to love. Yet it says, when we see this, because I know that it rises in my mind, the rise there seems to be this contradiction. If it is true that God loves impartially and without prejudice, Yet, when we read the text, it says that God loved, that yet it says He chose the nation of Israel to be such special object of His love. Uh -huh. Now, when you study that out, you find out that Israel was just a small, minute yes. people. All right. Of all the people of the world that God could have chosen, He chose Israel yes. uh -huh. yes. to be that people. To, to place His love upon them. See, so, when we come back to the text, we have two boys who, before they were ever born, before they'd ever done anything wrong, the Bible says, that God demonstrated this love towards Jacob and not his son. Because he's God. Because that's the way he loves. He loves him partially and without prejudice. He can do that. Not only that, but secondly, another shade of his love is God loves unconditionally. Amen? Yes. God loves unconditionally. The scripture makes it clear in so many ways that God loves us because of who he is rather than because of who we are. Yes. All right. All right. Are you glad of that? Yes. God loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are. Yes. Because we're not lovable. Yes. Most of us are not lovable. There are times in our lives where we're not lovable to our mates. God loves us because of who He is, not because of who we are. We need to remember that. Sometimes we get it in our head, God loves us because of who I am. Because I'm special, you know. I've got this, and I know this, and I know that. No, God doesn't love you because of any of that. Amen. God loves because of who He is. He offers to care for us, not because of our performance, our goodness, or even because of our efforts, or good intentions. He loves us because that's the kind of God he is. That's bad. He loves me even when I'm bad. All right. He loves me when I'm sad. Uh -huh. He loves me when I'm confused. Right. He loves me when I'm walking in the wrong direction. Oh. He still loves me. Amen? Amen. Yeah. If there's nothing else to rejoice about, we can rejoice in the love of God. Right. Yes. 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 It is this kind of unconditional love God showed to the nation of Israel when He made them His chosen people. Uh -huh. He didn't choose them because they were great. He didn't choose them because they were spiritual people. He chose them because of His love. Uh -huh. yes. He chose to put it to place His love on them. In Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse seven, and chapter nine, verse four and six, He said, "He did not choose Abraham's family because they were deserving, nor because of their number or their goodness." So, in essence, there was nothing about Israel that should have caused God to place His love upon them or to look upon them in a special way. Nothing there at all. 
All right. He chose him because it was within his right and power to use Abraham's descendants to tell the story of his love. And may I say to you this morning that that is the same as true today. That he chose you and I to, yes. to display his love towards you and I, not because of who we are, because of our great, but because of his own love. If it was dependent upon me and how much I loved him, I would fall very short. Yes. Uh, I would never measure to get to the point where I should love him like I should. And, he, if, and if it was determined upon me, my actions and my doing, to whether I would get receive God's love, I never received it. Uh -huh. You wouldn't either. Because there's nothing, the Bible says, there's nothing good in us that God should love us, that God should even look at us. Uh -huh. Or even consider us. But He does. Yes. Why? Because He's love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He not only loves, He is love. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. You get that? Yeah. We need to grab hold of that this morning. God is not, not, not only does He love you, but He is love. Amen. Amen. When you come to God, you're wrapped in love. Because that's His essential nature. That's His You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Dear later, Jesus makes this reference. He said He would teach His disciples to show one another the same unconditional Love that God has shown. And he says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. And persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And send rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? All right. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Mm -hmm. yes. The Bible tells us that Jesus loved you and when we were his enemies in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. Jesus gave a number of reasons for this admonition. And one of them was that this love is that that this love is a mark of maturity. You see, proving that we are that that we're the, the, let me go back. His, ex, his, his words in the gospel where he said, love your neighbors. It is when we love those who persecute us, we love those who are against us. It's a mark of maturity. All right, all right, all right. All right. When we can love those who do not love us, when we can love those who are not lovable, all right. it's a mark of maturity. That's the first sign of it, the, the reason for this. It's a mark of maturity, proving that we are the son of the Father and not just little children. You see, because if He's our Father, and we are, we, when we're born again, we're born from above, so we, we as Peter said, we become partakers of His nature. So we are to be like Him. When we walk around today in, in our jobs and in our places, do we bear the image of God towards those that are around us? All right, all right. Do, God, do people sense the love of God in you and I? Do people sense love at all in you and I? They should. Because we are, if we are God, we've got His nature. Yeah. Our love. Yeah. And we're to be, I read a book. The author is as a editor or a writer. He used to be a skeptic, but his name is Philip Yancey. He wrote a book entitled, What's So Amazing About Grace? It's a tremendous book, brought great conviction. One of the things that Yankee said in the book that just I have not got away from the fact that I was riding with a man the other day and shared this with him. Yankee said so many times we believe as Christians that we are to be uh, recipients of it, of grace. That we're just here, we're to be, you know, we're to pull it all in. But in reality, what God wants you and I to be is to be dispensers all right. of it. Yes. All right, all right. Yes. Sometimes we like the idea of being a recipient. We just want to hoard it up. And get, we like that good feeling, you know. We like that. We like all of that stuff. But that's not the purpose of it. Come on. Come on. Amen. God didn't show his love to you to hoard it to yourself. All right. All right. Amen. He showed it because he wanted you to spread it up. He wanted us to do that. How many and many times we can do that without saying anything. We can do that just by our actions. Yes. By the things that we do. 
I've had a number of occasions, uh, not to brag, but just a number of occasions where that I saw things that were happening or that were going on. One morning I was driving when I worked for the company I worked, I was driving and had delivered some equipment with a lady, a little lady, walking down the middle of the road, stopped me in my van. And she said, do you have anything? And she was shaking and scared, and, and I said, no, I don't have anything. And then when I left, I noticed, I looked down, and I had a cup in the cup holder, and I had a bunch of coins in that change that I just dropped in there. I whipped around and went back and gave it to her. I know I had to, mm -hmm. uh, because it's the right thing to do. I mean, I'm because I feared <laughs> I told her I didn't have any man. I looked down at that cup. So I, I took it when I saw the cup. The Lord said, go back and give it to her. Amen. You know? But then there was another instance. We, I worked with a guy at this place where I worked. And he's a salesman there. He has two girls. And they brought two girls into their family. They don't, he doesn't make a lot of money working there. I have a house where the basement flooded. The landlord wouldn't even deal with it. He had to pull all the drywall out. It has no walls, drywall. And Ruthie and I put aside coins. Uh, now she's taking nickels and dimes, and I take the quarters. Uh, but at that point, we were putting them all together. And we had saved a whole parcel. Uh, that's a southern term for you guys. Amen. A parcel. Uh, we'd saved a whole parcel. And I said, let's give them to him and his wife so they can go out to eat sometime. It amounted to about $50 or something. Gave it to him. Past time passed by. And just a week or two before I got laid off. He said, George, you remember that money you gave us? And I said, yeah. He said, my wife had set it aside. He said, we had talked about it one night that the kids at school were doing some project and every kid was supposed to give X amount of money uh, towards the project. And she had asked him about it and they said they'd talk about it the next day. Well, he, they didn't do it. And she remembered the next morning that it was that she forgot, but she took the money and she took it to school. And each kid had to have so much money to give. And he said, George, here's what I'm going to tell you. He said, the exact amount of money you gave was what we needed to make sure every single child had money. Amen. It's not because of me. It's not because of my wife. It's because of being a dispenser of love. Yes. Of showing love. Yes. You see, it's the small things that we do that can make the difference. It's a mark of maturity. Number two, it's Godlike. The Father has shared his good things with you and I who opposed him. Love is like the sunshine and rain that the Father sends graciously. It's a testimony to others. God expects you and I to live on a much higher plane than lost people of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who return good for, e good for good and evil for evil. As his children, we are returning good for evil as an investment of our love. Yes. God loves, God's love, God loves conditionally. Jesus reflected this side of God's love when he said to his disciples, The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I am come forth from God. You see, God has a special family life for those who believe in his son. Amen? Amen. For those who believe in his son. You see, this love is special love that goes beyond his affection for the whole world. Yes. God is not only love, he loves according to the counsel of his wisdom, his goodness, and his eternality. His love is not blind or indulgent or short-sighted. His love is tough. It's tender. It's on His terms rather than ours. And it's for the sake of His glory rather than our desires. Do we deserve His love? No. By no means. The idea loves him. And sometimes, because His love is as described here, sometimes it is tough. All right. Sometimes we think that, that God is against us. But even in that toughness, God is showing His love, pouring out His love on you and trying to teach you and I. Right. Trying to bring us more into the image of His own likeness right. that we might be more like Him. Yes. Right. Amen? Yes. Yes. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, 
God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners. That, that verse blows my mind. That's it. That's it. While we were yet sinners. Paul said in Ephesians 2, he said, while we were dead in our transgression and sin, God loved you. And may I remind you this morning, you and I didn't do anything to deserve that. Yes. Right. You and I didn't do anything to deserve God calling us out yes. and, and, yes. and placing His love upon you. We didn't do anything. Yes. If we deserved anything, we deserved the opposite of that. All right. And it's even true now. If we deserved anything, we deserve the opposite of that. None of us deserve to go to heaven. None of us deserve the blessings of God. It's only because of the love of God that we are to See, it is He who God stooped down to save sinners. It's God who stooped down. Man didn't reach up to God. He's not reaching for God. He's running from God. Amen. But thank God. God reached down one day and grabbed Brother Gary by the hand and said, You're one of mine. And pulled him out in the blood. And He did that for all of us. He didn't do it because Gary's special. Because Gary's a great preacher. No doubt he is. That had nothing to do with his life being shown to Gary. Notice how Paul says he proved his love. He said, by giving up his son to die for us, God proved his love for us. Yes. How many of us would be willing to give up our son mm -hmm. for a man who committed treason or for a man who murdered or one of the greatest men living, for one of the greatest men living? How many of us would give up our child for someone like that? All right, all right. How many of us would take the place of a person that's condemned on death row tonight? How many of us would step up here his place and say, I'll take his place and die for him? Mm -hmm. Not me, though. Not many of us would give up our children. We'd have a hard time doing that. Yes. But yet God did. The creator of the universe. The one who, who, did, who did it even though he didn't have to. Right. Right. Even though we didn't deserve it. He yes. did. He said because of I love them, I'm going to show that love. And what did he do? He didn't close his arm. He opened his arm. Amen. 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 this one act, God giving His Son, we can see the enormous price God proved, paid, proving His love. He paid the ultimate price. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let me ask you, I have to ask myself this question. How big of a price have we paid for love which we enjoy? Yes. All right. Wow. What does it cost of us? Mm. Most of us live in convenience. Mm -hmm. Most of us live pretty much shelter.
she said this to me a number of times. And she said, George, she said, she said, you're different. She said, you're a wise man. She said, I don't understand you. You see, it's not because I'm trying to be anybody or anything. It's just trying to show the love of God. Mm -hmm. Show the image of God to other people. Other people. I drive for Uber. Amen. I don't know if that's a, you know, a, a compliment or, <laughs> or what it is. But I've had the opportunity to talk to people. Talked to a man yesterday, or the other day. Uh, he, was, he said he'd written, he had read a quote from Gun. But he said to me, he said, George, he said, I had an experience a couple of months ago. He said, and it shook me. And take it now, this man, I don't know him. Him and I just, he gets in the car and I'm taking the airport where he's going. He said, I had this experience the other day, because he, he mentioned the quote of Gandhi, that Gandhi talked about that, that it was all about love, you know, drifted drip, into love. And he said, he said, uh, he has sugar or something like that wrong with him. But he said, he said, I went home and said, my wife was downstairs, and I went upstairs and went to bed. They had gotten a dog that they adopted a month or so earlier. And he said, in the middle of the night, he said, the dog started to bark. And my wife came running up the steps to find out what was going on. And he had gone into a coma. And he said, George, he said, that dog is why I'm alive. Because that dog alerted his wife mm -hmm. that he was up for half dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting part. A month or two after he got better, the dog just all of a sudden died. Mm -hmm. Now that, that really caused cold chills to go down my back. Uh, Think about it. That dog was placed there for a purpose to save that man's life. But he talked about that experience. He said to me, he said, George, he said, you know, he said, when I was there half dead, he said, all this stuff I worry about, he said, it, it wasn't there no more. I said, no, it won't be. When you're gone, you're gone. You know, all this stuff you know, we worry about now that's really insignificant ain't really going to matter then. Come on. It ain't important then. Right. It's important now for us, but it shouldn't be. Because the Bible says God will provide all of our needs. Amen. But you know, I found that to be striking. He said the first thing that he saw when he woke up, he said it, it so amazed him. He said the first thing I saw when I woke up, he said those guys were standing over me smiling and said, welcome back. Wow. Amen. Amazing. God's love. He wants us to be his friends with him. God did pay the greatest price of the for giving his son. He gave up the son to die for the unworthy, useless, the ungodly, the sinful, the wicked, the prey, the worst sinners, and outcast imaginable. Paul said of himself, he said, I am the cheapest of them. He said, I'm the worst of them. God proves his love by his justification through the blood of Christ. He said in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the verse. Therefore being justified. Amen. By faith. Yes. Catch that. Don't, don't speed by that. How does it happen? Faith. Faith. Not by our works. You're not justified by your works. Mm -hmm. You're not justified because of your creed or because of, of, of your, your family or whatever. You're not justified that way. You're not brought into the kingdom because your mama's in the kingdom. Come on. Come on. You're not brought into the kingdom because you're a good person. Come on. Come on. He said, therefore, being justified by faith through. How? Through. Who? The Lord Jesus Christ. All right, all right. The word justification is defined as to count someone righteous. Now, notice the definition because I, I had really struggled with it. It means to reckon, to credit, to account, to judge, to treat, to look upon as righteous. Now, notice the definition. Let's go back to the beginning. To count someone righteous. Now, that doesn't, that definition is not saying that you are righteous. The definition is saying he is counting you as righteous. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's counted to you as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Your righteousness comes about because of what he did, not because of what you yes. did. Yes. Because yes. we are not righteous. There are none of us righteous. None of us have done good. So God, through justification, God justifies us. In other words, because of the death of His Son, He now counts us as being righteous when we, by faith in Christ, 
come to Him. Yes. Because of what Jesus did, we are now counted as righteous. Amen. We can now stand before God without guilt and without shame. Yes. What does God do during that time? If you study the book of Romans, you find in the first three chapters of the book of Romans, Romans is, de is defined as a, as a court hearing when you begin to read it. You have three people there, three people, defendants there, that are on trial in Romans up to chapter 3. You have the heathen, you have the uh, hypocrites, and you have the godless, the godly, the Christian. And the Bible says, those that are religious basically, the Bible says, when you get to chapter 3, that God declares of all three defendants in that chapter, He said, they are all guilty. The religious, the hypocrite, and the heathen. He said, they're all guilty. But let me show you something. Come here, Brother Derry. The two gentlemen in the back, come here. The two, please, the two gentlemen come here. This is my three defendants. We'll make Gary the righteous one. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you I knew fixed the moment. <laughs> but here they are. You have, you have the religious, you have the hypocrite, you have the heathen. God has looked at all of them. No, no offense, brother. <laughs> <laughs> the judge of the universe looks down at all three of these. And he says, Guilty. Now we know from the Bible that the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. So what does that mean? That means that all three of them deserve to die. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now let me show you something. I did this when I passed through to Norfolk and West Virginia. Here's what God did. God comes down off of his throne. Here's what he does. He takes his righteousness and he wraps it around. All right. Amen? All right. He takes his righteousness and puts it around his throne. He come down off of his throne, took his robe, and put it on you and put it on you.
extent that he doesn't tell it. Look at it. The Bible says that Joshua and them went in to Ai, and they were told not to, to or to Jericho, they were told not to take anything. Yeah. They weren't to take anything. They were to destroy everything in there. Mm -hmm. Achan, a man no doubt of good intentions, a man no doubt that was upright, you know, a, a reputable man, but he saw all these goods and the, the coat and the money and the stuff like that. What does he decide to do? He decides to take some for himself. Yes. And the Bible says that he was so brave that he took what he got and he took it in the tent, in his tent, and buried it under his bed. Now, the purpose of telling that is to look at what happened. God hates sin to this extent. What happened? When Joshua calls him out, what does God say to do to Achan? God says, kill him, his wife, his children, and all his animals. That's how much God hates sin. He was not going to have it propagated the rest of the way through the camp. Through the camp. And so what does he do? He destroys all of them. That's righteous anger. You know, and I, mine and your eyes, we say, well, that's unfair. Why would he kill his wife? Why would he kill the little children? That's what he said to us. He said, kill them all. Why? Because God doesn't tolerate sin. God is angry with the wicked every day. We need to, as I said earlier, see, it's only when we have a right understanding, the right view of God, that we can understand his love, we can understand his anger, and his attitude towards our sin. His attitude towards our sin is because of who he is. Because he's loved. Because he's light. And it is supposed to be true that where light comes, the darkness is just despair. Light and darkness can't stay in the same room. You can't, you can't, as John said, you can't, you can't claim to have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Our sin has aroused God's anger and wrath. Therefore, the greatest need in man's life is to discover the answer to the question, how can the relationship between man and God be restored? Yes. Why does God justify man? Because of the Son, Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in the Son of God, he takes that faith counted as righteous. Note, the man is not righteous, but God considered and credits the man's faith as righteous. He does this because he loves the man so much that he sent his son to die. Because of what the son Christ has done for man, it is Jesus who has secured for man the ideal righteousness. That, how, that, the, the how of justification. That's how we're justified. Because of what Jesus did. Not because of what I've done or can The word justified is a legal term taken from the court. It pictures a man on trial before God. See, is seen as having committed the most heinous crimes. He's rebelled against God, broken his relationship with God. How is it he can restore this relationship? In our courts, if a man is acquitted, he is declared innocent. But this is not true with the divine court. When a man appears before God, he is anything but innocent. He is utterly guilty and condemned accordingly. It is our faith that God takes and counts it as righteous. Thus, God treats man as if he were innocent. Notice the phrase. He treats us as if we are innocent. We're not, but he treats us because of what Christ did. Because of his death. God justifies him. God. The result of this is peace with God. Amen? Amen. Because God has justified us, declared us righteous. He, we have peace with God. It was Him who reconciled men to God, Christ. He, made, he has made this peace by the blood of His cross. God has showed His love through salvation, which is an extend, extending of His grace to man. Paul wrote, It is by grace we have been saved through faith. It is not our own doing. It is His gift. Grace means salvation completely apart from any merit or work on our part. Yes, yes. It's not what I can do. I'm going to close here. There's more to this. I told you I wouldn't finish it. It's noon. <laughs> right. 
But the question is, is one, how is it that God has loved us? Take that question home. Yeah. And serve it. Maybe get you a piece of paper. Yes. Write that question on the top. And then just begin to list the way that God has showed you love to Jesus. Amen. And how many times we fail to see those things. Mm. Sometimes I think it's good that we stop and do those things. We stop and ask ourselves, how has God loved me? Mm. What has God done for me? When we find those things, then we ought to be thankful and express gratitude. Lord, again, we ask that not so much of what we have said, but you promise to take your word to the hearts of people, cause it to bring conviction, cause it to stir them to do what you would have them to do. We pray that that's the result of this morning, not because of me or my words. We do thank you for the opportunity and every opportunity when we can stand and share your word with others. We pray that it's been a blessing, it's been a help, we pray that you use it, we ask it in Christ's name.